Well, most of the transfer portal attention for Gonzaga has gone to the backcourt, but Mark Few's team is connected to an elite, elite rim protector who would immediately bolster the Zags defensively. Who is he? Are the Zags going to land him? Let's discuss. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Well, folks, we got two transfer portal targets to discuss today, one in the front court, one in the back court. We are going to round out the show discussing a new game added to Gonzaga's schedule for the 2023-24 season, their first official home game that we have on the calendar. We're going to talk about that, what we do know about Gonzaga's schedule, as well as a couple zags in the MLB update as the baseball season has gotten started. But we're going to start in the front court. Because so much of the conversation we have had here on Locked on Zags has been about potential backcourt additions. Of course, the recent addition of Steel Venters being the primary topic of conversation. We have talked at length about Taron Armstrong from Cal Baptist and the potential for the Zags to land him at the point guard position. We talked about Ryan Nemhard, who is still out there, although hasn't been strongly connected to Gonzaga. We talked about... LJ Cryer, who would have been a fantastic addition. He unfortunately has departed to join the Houston Cougars. But today we're going to talk about a front court player. That front court player is Jesse Edwards from Syracuse. Recently entered the transfer portal, has been connected to Gonzaga. They are one of the schools who has reached out, who has showed interest uh, amongst a handful of other programs. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, but I want to talk a little bit about who Edwards is. Edwards is a four-year player from Syracuse. He is transferring as he's effectively a grad, not effectively, he is a grad transfer. He is transferring with one year of eligibility remaining. Gonzaga, of course, has very often utilized graduate transfers, even before the transfer portal allowed anybody to transfer and play without having to sit out a year. Gonzaga has always been active in the transfer portal market. Bolton was a graduate transfer. Of course, he had an extra year of eligibility. Byron Byron Wesley was a graduate transfer. Jordan Matthews was a graduate transfer. Gino Crandall was a graduate transfer. Aaron Cook was a graduate transfer. This has been a often used pipeline for success for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. For Edwards, he has had a trajectory that is reminiscent of many Zags bigs in the past in the sense that he has steadily grown from a production perspective from his freshman year until his big breakout season last year. In his first two years with Jim Beheim in the Orange, he didn't play much. He played 39 total games in those two seasons, averaged just under eight minutes per night, 2.2 points and 2.1 rebounds. He was effectively the third or fourth big in that rotation and wasn't seeing a lot of playing time. He then blossomed into a starter during the 2021-22 season. Only played in 24 games. There was an injury there. But in those 24 games, he started every single one of them, played 28 minutes per night, averaged 12 points, six and a half boards, 2.8 blocks. Yeah, we're going to come back to that. You bet. 1.1 steals, shot 69.5% from the field. Folks, 69.5% from the field. That is Drew Timmy-esque, of course, 12 points per game in 28 minutes as opposed to Drew Timmy, who has far, scored far more points per game, but 69.5%. It unfortunately carried another Drew Timmy characteristic with him when he shot 59.8% from the free throw line and did not take any threes, but still a highly efficient scorer around the rim and an elite rim protector. And that was his junior year. He did even better as a senior this past season with Syracuse, 32 games, 32 starts, 32 minutes per night, nice and even there, 14 and a half points, bumped up to 10.3 rebounds. That's a huge jump 
from six and a half rebounds in 28 minutes to 10.3 rebounds in 32 minutes, a very intentional move to gobble up more rebounds in his senior season. He averaged 2.7 blocks, so very consistent there at just under three blocks per night, bumped up to 1.4 steals per game. The efficiency came down, but not dramatically. He was 69.5, which again is obscenely good. He dropped down to 59.2% as a senior, but considering how much more of an effort there likely was by opposing ACC teams to slow him down as an offensive threat, still being able to shoot just about 60% in the ACC, very, very excellent. Uh, And fortunately for him, that free throw percentage bumped up considerably. Again, 59.8%. As a junior, that's enough to kind of raise your eyebrows at. The Zags have had some bad free throw shooting bigs in recent years, but uh, this past season, all the way up to 73%. That is a huge jump from year to year and nice, encouraging to see him show such improvement in that area. But here's the deal with Jesse Edwards. Huge group of schools that are involved in him. He's from the Netherlands. He played high school basketball at IMG Academy. He's got a laundry list of programs. We're going to show interest in Gonzaga. I feel like should be at the top of this list. And we'll go through the schools right now that have shown interest and reached out to Jesse Edwards. That is the only language we have so far is that these schools have reached out to Jesse Edwards. Of course, Gonzaga, Georgia, LSU, Arkansas, West Virginia, BYU, Seton Hall, Mizzou, Vanderbilt, Florida, NC State, and Memphis. And look, this is a good group of schools. I'm not trying to discredit this group of, of programs at all. Arkansas obviously has been to three straight Sweet 16s, has been fantastic, could absolutely use some reinforcements in their front court. Uh, LSU is a program kind of back on the rise after having a really disastrous last year. Uh, Mizzou NCAA tournament team had a lot of success last year. Bob Huggins and West Virginia can never, ever be counted out. Frankly, I think Todd Golden is an absolute weapon here as a transfer, as, as a guy who I think could acquire some really high level transfers at Florida. We've already seen him pull some really nice names. NC State and Memphis, both NCAA tournament teams as well. But Gonzaga's record of developing bigs and showcasing front court talent and helping lead players into the NBA is, I mean, the reputation speaks for itself. Look at the guys in the NBA. Look at Brandon Clark. Look at where Drew Timmy came from and where he ended up at his collegiate career. Even a guy like Shemek Karnowski, the, the development that he had. You, I mean, you, the list goes on and on and on. And, and for Gonzaga, this would be a one-year deal. So they're not going to necessarily develop Edwards, but they're going to showcase his skills. They're going to get a high usage rate for him, get him down on the block, get him operating, and and really, I think, showcase his abilities in front of a ton of NBA scouts. And I think looking at the rest of this list, there's so many factors that we're not aware of. I don't know, you know, where Jesse Edwards has connections in terms of his personal life, in terms of his family life, if he has any in in the States, in terms of other coaches who may know him. I don't know, and I'm not necessarily privy to all of that information. But from a school perspective, if you're looking at an opportunity to go start and be a starting center somewhere, Gonzaga is as good of a place as any. And that's what I want to talk about here to kind of close out this segment. Gonzaga is not going to land Jesse Edwards unless they he knows or he believes strongly that he is going to be the starting center for this team next year. And that's something that I'm curious how Gonzaga is pitching that right now. Because we don't know what the situation with, is with Anton Watson. No news. I, somebody asked me if no news is good news on Anton Watson. I think no news is no news on Anton Watson. He just has not said anything yet. He has another year of eligibility. He has not entered the transfer portal. He does not strike me as, as an obvious candidate to go to the NBA draft. That does not mean that he will not do that or even that he shouldn't do that. I think he's got a real chance of getting some serious attention from NBA scouts uh, if he were to at least enter that, go through that process but I don't know what he's thinking. He's been in college for four years. Maybe he wants to move on. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's planning to come back and that's just why we haven't heard anything. But if Watson and Greg both come back, they're kind of penciled in as the starters right now. Does Edwards move shift that around? Does Watson start at the four? Does Ben Greg come off the bench? Like those are questions that they're going to have to answer to, for me, I would start Jesse Edwards, and that's not a knock on Ben Gregg. That's not a knock on Anton Watson, but the Zags desperately need rim protection. I mean, they desperately need it. It was a huge issue for them last year, and the, all of Gonzaga's defense was bad last year. It was not just – it wasn't any individual player's fault. It wasn't just the coach's fault. I think it was some combination of not having great personnel, not having a rim protector to erase any mistakes, and coaching decisions that I think – helped lead to not having great defense. Mark Few's never been a great defensive coach. I, I think that's a reasonable assessment of him as a coach and ways that Gonzaga has played well defensively, despite not 
being great schematically is by having high level rim protection. If you can get a guy like Jesse Edwards who averages three blocks per game in the ACC, you have to do that. And you have to shift guys around and you have to change roles. Ben Gregg would be one of the best backup bigs in the country. I really believe that if he were to come off the bench next season. What, what would that do for him and his mentality going forward? All stuff that you have to evaluate, you have to answer. But at the end of the day, you can't let that dictate. You can't let that prevent you from landing a player who could make that kind of impact for your team on the defensive end of the floor. Just to put it in perspective, Jesse Edwards blocked 87 shots last year. Again, in the ACC, it was a down year for the ACC, but there's a lot of really high-level guards and a high-level talent in that conference. Edwards blocked 87 shots. That would be ninth in school history for Gonzaga. History. All time, it would be ninth. It would be the third most blocks in a single season behind both Brandon Clark and Chet Holmgren, who, of course, tied with 117. This would be the third most blocks in a single season ever. This is the kind of impactful defensive player that Jesse Edwards could be. And to me, he is a must add. If Gonzaga can find a way to get him into Spokane and into a uniform, they can figure out how the rest of that front court is going to shake out outside of that. But adding a player with this kind of defensive caliber and efficiency around the rim is paramount to helping this team get back into the sweet 16 and further next season well discussing the front court was fun but there is another point guard option the zags have expressed interest in via the transfer portal it's not taryn armstrong it's not ryan nemhard who is it we'll tell you more after today's a word excuse me from today's sponsor fanduel Grand slams, no hitters, and double plays, they're all back. And there is no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, new customers can get step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. Maybe you Zag fans want to bet on Marco Gonzalez to get a win for the Mariners or perhaps Eli Morgan to snag a save for the Guardians. More on both those players later in the show. But don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel, an official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags. And I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. We're talking all things transfer portal these weeks, what teams have improved, what teams have maybe not improved, what teams still have work to do, what the way too early top 10 might look like next season. We got it all. All of it covered Locked On College Basketball. Find it on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, well, we talked Jesse Edwards from Syracuse in the first segment as a potential six foot 11 rim protecting center the Zags could pursue, have pursued, and should attempt to land via the transfer portal. We're going to pivot back to talking about guards. That has been the common theme of the transfer portal conversations up to this point. We've talked about Taron Armstrong. We've talked about Ryan Nemhard before he committed. We talked about LJ Cryer. There are a handful of other guards that are, are certainly in the mix for Gonzaga to potentially land, even after having landed steel venters from Eastern Washington. The guy I want to focus on here in the second segment is Stephen Ashworth. Stephen Ashworth is out of Utah State, a very surprise team from last season. They were one of the top 25 teams in the net, top 25 team in Ken Palm throughout the season. Disappointed once they got into the NCAA tournament. Kind of the story of the Mountain West for many years, although San Diego State clearly helped remove that uh, that kind of reputation from the Mountain West by going you know all the way to the dang national championship game. Shout out the Aztecs for that. But Ashworth is a six foot one point guard who I believe has just one year of eligibility remaining. And I say I believe because Keeping track of players' eligibility these days is, is difficult. He has played three years. His first year was 2020-2021. I do not believe they're giving out COVID exceptions, except if you were around in the 1920 season. So by my math, he should only have one year of eligibility remaining. We'll see. Who knows? It's, it's difficult to keep track. In terms of why he's in the portal, it's fairly obvious. His head coach, Ryan Odom, the head coach of the Aggies last year, has taken the job at VCU, which has led to three players, including Mr. Ashworth here, to enter the portal. Similar to Jesse Edwards, Ashworth has been a developmental piece who has blossomed recently uh, in his career at Utah State. 
He was a role player in both 2020-2021 and the following 21-22 season. He played a role, but he wasn't starting. He wasn't playing significant minutes for them. Uh, And then he had his breakout. And even in his breakout season last year, he played 35 games. He only started 25 of them. So he was still had to fight his way to become a consistent starter for this Utah State team. But he played 33.2 minutes per game. So clearly, once he got into that starting lineup, he was not letting go of any of that playing time throughout the season. And why should he have? Here are his numbers on the year. 16.2 points per game, 4.5 assists. rebounds and 1.2 steals per game. Another one of those guys who really lights up your fantasy team. For those of you degenerates who play college basketball fantasy, uh, if you do, let me know. I love it. I'm into it. That sounds fantastic. Steven Ashworth, the kind of guy you'd want to have on your team. He was a 51.4% shooter last year from two and a 43.4% shooter from deep. That's the number. Just like the 2.8 blocks per game was the big key when talking about Jesse Edwards, 43.5% from three. Boy, howdy, does that stand out as the key number when talking about Stephen Ashworth as a potential addition for the Zags. In fact, for his three years at Utah State, 5.1 attempts per game from three is his average 40.9% of those bad boys go down. So five attempts per game, knocking them down just over 40% of the time. Sign me up. Zags are not the only school showing interest right here. It is a good list of schools. Creighton, Florida, Todd Golden, him and Mark View getting real friendly on the recruiting trail these days. Oklahoma State is involved. Colorado State, VCU, totally unexpected or totally expected there that Ryan Odom, when jumping to a new program, would try to take the best players from Utah State that he can and bring them up there. UCF, Central Florida is involved. UW and Washington State, both trying to keep him in the state or bring him to the state of Washington alongside Gonzaga. And then Cal and SMU, the final school involved. BYU, I wanted to highlight them separately because Stephen Ashworth is LDS. He is a Mormon from Latter-day Church of the Latter-day Saints, tends to help BYU from a recruiting perspective. It does not guarantee it. Case in point, Stephen Ashworth not playing for BYU right now. So definitely not a con- entirely driving factor, but it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it as a potential advantage leg up for Mark Pope and BYU to bring Ashworth with them into the Big 12 next season. Quite honestly, would be a very good fit for them and a player that they really need. So if they were to land him, that would make a lot of sense. But for Gonzaga, I think they have as good a chance as anybody else here, assuming, of course, that they do not land Taron Armstrong. If by the time you're listening to this, Taron Armstrong has committed to Gonzaga, don't stop listening. (laughs) Just skip ahead to the third segment. We'll talk about the schedule. We'll talk about everything else. But I don't see the Zags landing Armstrong and Ashworth or Armstrong and really any other point guard specific player. Ashworth is 6'1 and averaged four and a half assists per game last year. He is a point guard. There's not any, he's not an off ball player. He's not a combo guard. He is a point guard. And if the Zags were to land Armstrong, excuse me, Ashworth, it would be because they are not landing Taron Armstrong. It would be because they're not landing Ryan Nembhard, which, as I mentioned, I haven't heard a super strong connection to Gonzaga with him just now. That could change, of course. But it would be the Zags landing Ashworth to be their primary point guard for next season. It would push Nolan Hickman either into a bench role or into an off-ball role. I have mentioned a handful of times on this show that Nolan Hickman playing a little bit more off-ball may not be a bad thing for the Zags next season. Not that he was particularly bad in the point guard role. He didn't turn the ball over all that much. He just didn't rack up a ton of assists. And and really, just from from an eye test perspective, he didn't make a lot of things happen. And I don't think that's necessarily bad or that 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 wouldn't change if Gonzaga tried to change his role and kind of get him to be a little bit more uh, running the show type. But if they brought in somebody who's already kind of has that skill set, somebody like Ashworth, who last season averaged four and a half assists and 1.7 turnovers, that's pretty darn good. If they can bring in a player like that, that can shift Hickman off the ball, make him more of a catch and shoot shooter, which I think he could really excel at. Let him attack closeouts, drive to the basket, do that stuff and be less kind of in charge of facilitating the offense. I think that could really work. And I think adding Ashworth and adding Steel Venters makes Gonzaga a lethal outside shooting team, especially if they get Malachi Smith back. Oh man. You could be looking at a lineup that in theory includes Stephen Ashworth, 43% last year. 
It could include Malachi Smith, who's a 40 plus percent three point shooter. It could include Steel Vendors, who's a 40 plus percent three point shooter. It could include Ben Gregg, who's potentially could be a 38, 37 plus percent three point shooter. And then Anton Watson, if he were to return as the starting five, or if they were to land somebody like Jesse Edwards, not necessarily big contributor. Jesse Edwards, not a three point shooter at all. Anton Watson showed some capability as it last year, but we could be talking about a Gonzaga team that could space the floor four or five wide and just bomb threes all over you. Would Mark Few want that necessarily? No, that's not necessarily what he wants to run. But man, having a team full of dudes who can light it up from beyond the arc would be really, really fun and would really, really challenge opposing defenses. Utah State was a top 70 team defensively in the country. So they're the kind of team that I think Ashworth probably benefited from the coaching from the schematics from playing in the mountain west hard to kind of pin down exactly how good of a defender he was he averaged more than one steal per game in each of his last two seasons some of the advanced numbers don't love him as a defensive player again scheme schematics size all that stuff is going to matter defensively i as i've said with a lot of the guards that gonzaga has pursued in the portal they're pursuing a lot of guys who are primarily impactful on the offensive end of the floor that's kind of what makes jesse edwards the player we talked about in the first segment so important because he would be brought in for defense ashworth that's not necessarily the case high level shooter good facilitator doesn't turn the ball over all that much i think you could see how he would be a very very solid addition especially if this team has to pivot away from taron armstrong or ryan nemhard Ashworth would be a, a guy that I think you'd feel more than comfortable snagging from Utah State, penciling him into the starting lineup alongside Hickman, potentially alongside Malachi Smith or Dusty Stromer, and letting him run the show. And you would feel completely confident that he would have the ability to do that and help lead this team back into the Sweet 16 again next season. All right, we're going to close out the show discussing Gonzaga adding Yale to the 2023-24 schedule. That's their first home game that we know of in 2023. They're going to be playing Yale out of the Ivy League. We're going to talk about what we know about the schedule so far. We're also going to give a quick Zags and the MLB update, all coming up right after this. All right, segment three, Stony Patton's still locked on Zags. Going away from talking about transfer portal targets for the Bulldogs and instead looking ahead to the 2023-24 non-conference basketball schedule we don't know much but we know a little bit more today than we knew yesterday after a report from john rothstein of cbs on twitter indicated that the zags have added yale to their schedule for the 2023-24 season the date of this game is unknown but it will be played at the kennel that is what we know this is the first home game officially added to gonzaga's schedule the zags or excuse me yale is the only ivy league school that has ever played gonzaga they have only ever played one Ivy League school. It was Yale back in 1991, December of 1991. The Zags beat Yale 70 to 59. Some of you listening weren't born yet. Some of you listening really hate it that I just said that out loud. I understand where you're at with that. But case in point, it has been 32 years since the Zags played a Ivy League squad. They're going to do it again. Yale, good basketball program. 21 wins last season. They won the Ivy League regular season championship. They did not represent the Ivy League in the NCAA tournament. Most of you probably know who did. It is Princeton. Princeton finished second in the Ivy League regular season, defeated Yale in the Ivy League tournament, earned a 15 seed, and blasted blasted Tommy Lloyd and the Arizona Wildcats as a two seed in the first round of the NCAA tournament ended up making a very nice sweet 16 run for Princeton shout them out so they're the team that's getting the most attention out of the Ivy League but Harvard or excuse me Yale was the better team in the regular season they've been added to the schedule that's a fun matchup for the Zags to get uh, right now the only games we know for the Zags are Yale at home Kentucky on the road of course part of that six-year series that John Calipari and Mark Few agreed to last year the Zags will also play UW on the road. That one will be in Seattle. Should be a fun one there. And then Hawaii for the Maui Invitational. We know the teams that are going to be in the Maui Invitational. We, of course, don't know the matchups yet, but Gonzaga will face some combination of Chaminade, as we always know, in the Maui Invitational. And then is a laundry list of very excellent programs, UCLA, Tennessee, Syracuse, Purdue, Marquette, and Kansas fantastic tournament shaping up in Maui over Thanksgiving that UW Kentucky Yale early early stages of Gonzaga putting together their non-conference schedule always fun to see who they are planning to play I want to close out the show with just a shout out to the Zags and the MLB 
we try to talk about baseball once or twice a week on the podcast, usually uh, at the end of the week to kind of preview Gonzaga's upcoming weekend series. They're playing Oregon State right now. In fact, as we're speaking, uh, as I'm recording this on Tuesday evening, they're playing Oregon State right now. We'll have some recaps about that game uh, later in the week and their more upcoming series. But don't want to forget about the Zags in the MLB because we try to do a lot of talk about the Zags in the NBA as well. And we're going to have a big coverage on that now that the NBA regular season is over. We'll talk about Andrew Nembhardt's incredible rookie season for those of you who weren't paying attention to what Zach Collins did as a member of the San Antonio Spurs. Incredible performance from him. For those of you who may have missed, Corey Kispert went on an absolute heater to end his season in Washington, put together far and away the best season of his professional career. We'll talk all about that. But today, today's about the Zags in the MLB. And there's only two of them. So we're going to cover who those guys are, who else might join them at some point this year. Uh, The first name is the name that has been the most synonymous with MLB Zags since Jason Bay. And that's Marco Gonzalez. Marco Gonzalez remains a member of the rotation for the Seattle Mariners. There was some talk this offseason that he might get bumped out of his rotation spot, end up being a long reliever, end up being a regular reliever, end up getting traded or cut or something like that. Did not come together. The Mariners are once again relying on Marco. He has played two games for them so far this season, two starts on the bump, 1-0 and uh, for his record, 4.22 ERA. He's only got six strikeouts in 10 innings, but he's never really been a strikeout guy, so that's not too surprising. Looking forward to continuing to see Marco be a stalwart for the Seattle Mariners as they get out of the rebuild and into continued playoff success going forward. I know many of you are Mariners fans. I'm with you. I love it. It's awesome to see the Mariners do well. It's awesome to see Marco be a part of that. Uh, Eli Morgan, the other name here to keep an eye on. Uh, he is a playing a high leverage relief role for the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, five games so far this season, six innings, 1-0. Hasn't given up a run yet. Nine strikeouts and one walk. That is fantastic. And seeing him succeed, Cleveland has always been one of the best teams in the entire MLB at developing pitching. And so when they drafted Morgan, I think they drafted him in the eighth round, like four or five, six years ago, maybe uh, you could kind of tell like, Hey, this is a program that has the opportunity to, to really get the best out of Eli and make him the best version of himself that he can be. And that's what we're seeing. He kind of, he was a starter early in his career and, and did okay at that. But I think Cleveland identified correctly that let's move him to the bullpen. He'll stuff with play up down there, have a little bit more velocity, be able to focus more on his secondary pitches that are better, like his changeup, which is extraordinary. He's more of a fastball changeup guy. And, He's having a ton of success, so it's been fantastic to see what he has been able to do in his major league career. A couple more guys I just wanted to mention who I think will be big leaguers at some point this season. Wyatt Mills, former third-round pick by the Mariners, ended up getting traded to Kansas City. I believe he's with Boston now. Might end up finding his way into the big leagues at some point this season. Taylor Jones, who has played... 43 big league games already in his career. He is in AAA with the Los Angeles Angels, first base, left field, DH type. So he could be an option for them if they had an injury to Jared Walsh or to Taylor Ward or to some of the other players that kind of fill those roles for the Halos. Uh, a guy, he's only played 20, he's at seven games under his belt at AAA right now, hitting 250 with three RBIs. But I think there's a good chance he ends up finding his way into the big leagues at some point this year. And then there's Alec Jacob. Alec Jacob, many of you will remember Jacob for throwing a no-hitter for Gonzaga a couple of years ago. Fantastic starting pitcher for the Zags. Has powered his way through San Diego's minor league system. He reached AAA last year. Even though he hasn't been in the system very long, he has been absolutely dominated. Is now showing up as one of their top prospects. Really cool development for Jacob. I He hasn't pitched yet this year, but I would not be surprised if he makes his major league debut towards the end of the season, which would be really cool to see for a young man who, who wasn't drafted all that high and kind of didn't have a lot of those expectations around him. And then shout out Gabriel Hughes, who again, as I am talking to you right now, is pitching for the Spokane Indians, making his minor league debut in Spokane. Very cool for him. Keep an eye on how he does this year. I'll, I'm going to catch him at some Hillsboro Hops games when the Hops are, or when Spokane is in town in Hillsboro. Any of you who are Beaverton, Portland area Zags who want to see a former Zag in action on the bump, let me know. They are coming to Hillsboro in early June. I'm not kidding. I'm going to be there. Come check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, also, for, for Zags fans who want to follow our baseball players as they ascend into the pros Tristan Vreeling and William Kempner and Brody Jesse all those guys were drafted last year in addition to Gabriel Hughes uh, Vreeling is with the New York Yankees in their farm system Kempner is with the San Francisco Giants in their system Brody Jesse is with the Cincinnati Reds in their system you can check out baseball reference fan graphs whatever it may be get some updates on how those guys are doing and check out the Locked on Zags podcast because guess what I'm gonna bring you these 
periodically throughout the season as we get into the summer months and there's a little bit less news and updates going on with the basketball program. We'll talk baseball. We'll talk about these guys, how they're doing, keeping you all up to date on all of the pro Zags because that's what we do here at Locked on Zags. We cover as much about this beautiful institution in Spokane as we possibly can. So stick with us through the out the off season. It is available wherever you get your podcast. Go check us out on YouTube. If you have not done so yet, just go to YouTube, search Locked on Zags, hit that big red subscribe button. It is very much appreciated. For now, I want to thank every single one of you for listening and give you a reminder. Go Zags.